guess um, most of my talk is given from the perspective of, um, I guess, um, uh, the patient perspective of diagnosis of rare diseases because I'm a rare disease patient and I lead a support group for uh, rare diseases. Um, anyway, um, I guess um, in 2008, um, I had the pleasure of uh, participating in uh, the American Lung Association I Am Lung Cancer poster campaign. Uh, the posters depicted about 10 or so lung cancer patient stories. Uh, I knew most of the um, other patients, including Delmer. Um, he used to dive for abalone and share it with us at our um, annual support group picnics. Anyway, Delmer sadly um, passed away um, shortly after the poster for this photo was taken. Um, in fact, um, the only other lung cancer patient um, in the posters um, whom I know of who didn't pass away within about a year of that was uh, Doris. And um, Doris got diagnosed and then treated for her uh, lung cancer early after she realized that lung cancer uh, must run in her family. So um, she got a CT scan, had surgery, and that seemed to have saved her life. Anyway, um, I guess the reason for um, this kind of sad outcome with this group was that um, the ribbon color for lung cancer is clear. Um, because symptoms of lung cancer um, uh, often don't appear until um, it's too late. Anyway, um, I guess I also survived. And um, my story is that um, I aimed for an academic career as a research scientist. And actually, I was hoping to um, work on um, finding new ways of developing treatments for disease, uh, among other things. Um, I worked hard. I applied myself. I graduated from MIT, got a doctorate from, in chemistry from an Ivy League school, and last worked as a postdoc here. Um, my dream was cut short after I became disabled with the symptoms of uh, lung carcinoid cancer. Uh, that's a rare and relatively slow-growing neuroendocrine lung cancer. Um, I had symptoms like repeated bronchitis and pneumonia and facial flushing for at least 15 years before diagnosis. Um, I developed fatigue such that I could no longer work years before I was diagnosed. And when I finally was diagnosed, um, I had been uh, without income or medical insurance for years. Um, when, and sadly, when I did get diagnosed, I learned that my cancer, um, if caught early, can often be cured by surgery. So this gave me um, a great interest in the earlier diagnosis of um, disease, um, of, uh, of rare disease especially. Anyway, um, not only is it that I sort of like live a life in poverty, and everything, but um, also um, I've been told that some centers bill for the shots that I get every two weeks at about $40,000 for shots. So I get shots. Um, they're about $40,000 a shot. I mean, nobody pays that much for them. But, um, you know, I get, so that's like $160,000 a month. Anyway, um, the aim of um, reducing um, the human and economic burden of delayed diagnosis forms a basis um, of a lot of uh, awareness re uh, efforts for uh, specific diseases from specific groups, and that's kind of understandable. Um, a prime objective of such efforts is to um, educate physicians about the specific diseases. Um, however, you know, when I really think about it, it is a problem that every doctor doesn't have the details about every rare disease in his head. And um, is it even reasonable to expect that that can happen? Um, I get, there are said to be about 8,000 rare diseases, um, each case of which can also have different manifestations, and that can also make diagnosis uh, problematic. So I don't think that um, it's reasonable for us to expect that every doctor is going to have knowledge of every rare disease in his head. Um, in my case, actually, I didn't even really feel upset with my doctors so much that they didn't know about my rare disease um, and what to look for to find it as I was um, uh, upset with um, at the moments that um, they stopped looking or um, stopped listening. And I've heard this in other patient stories, too. Um, anyway, um, the ribbon color for neuroendocrine cancers is zebra. 
Um, and I guess uh, the zebra is a symbol for a lot of rare diseases. It comes from an expression that's taught in medical school. When one hears hoofbeats, think horses, zebra. The doctor sometimes stop, um, stops looking, um, stops after going through the horses. And I think that causes a lot of the problem in, um, uh, you know, um, in, in uh, failure to diagnose uh, rare disease earlier. Um, and uh, they stop at the common diseases, and then they don't look any further um, for the zebras. And uh, the doctors can even dismiss the patient's concerns um, after the um, common diseases are eliminated. And this sort of thing and more can, um, that can go wrong um, by various paths can lead to delayed or, mis, um, or misdiagnoses and um, also damage the doctor-patient relationship. So what can the patient do and what can the doctor do to help overcome this and um, try to get to the earlier diagnosis of rare or not so rare diseases? Well, um, one thing that I think is really important um, is um, there is a lot of talk um, about empowering the patient these days. And there's even talk about eliminating um, the word um, patient um, in favor of something else. Um, at one center, I've already seen that they've replaced the word with consumer. I think that that puts like too much emphasis on the dollar sign. And um, I guess in these arguments, some people argue that the patient um, should not be patient, but proactive in seeking care as a basis for this kind of thinking. And, um, and so they say the word patient really just is not appropriate. I really disagree. Um, it's like the word uh, patient um, doesn't really mean patient. Um, it's my understanding that it comes from a Latin word that means to suffer. And um, I think that there's much power in the suffering of the patient. Um, I think that it can inspire or motivate those um, who have compassion to want to help and continue to look for answers. And maybe if the patient conveys that they are really suffering to the doctor, um, that maybe that can move the doctor to keep looking beyond um, where he is already and try to help. Um, an example of this, I guess, was after my lungs. I mean, diagnosis has been a lot of stuff. You've had your cancer cut out. It's sort of like you go through a re-diagnosis period to look for its return. And I had the symptoms of its return. But an oncologist I saw shortly after that kind of threw me off. And uh, he said that a paper I showed him about P53 was a bad paper in a bad journal with not enough data points. And I pointed out to him, hey, it's a rare cancer. And this guy used the data points he had. And I told him I wasn't there to defend the doctoral dissertation, but was there as a friend. And I started to cry. And I told him it meant a bad prognosis, according to the world's experts. And I really didn't want to die. And he started to look and started to try to help me. Anyway, part of the problem, too, is the doctors don't seem to be um, seem to spend less time with patients these days and have come to rely on technology um, to diagnose uh, things like labs, imaging, and evidence-based medicine. I hear a lot of patients complain about this, that they go to the doctor, that their results show nothing, and um, that the doctor tells them that there's nothing wrong with them and that it's all in their head. This actually is... Um, uh, a lot of the um, what patients report on their road to diagnosis stories for my particular disease. Um, and um, telling a patient that it's all in the head doesn't really help the patient who is still sick. It doesn't solve the problem. Anyway, um, and labs also can be misleading because if an error is made in the processing of like a blood sample or something, or um, if a scan's misread, then that's going to lead to the wrong conclusion. Anyway, um, the um, point that was just made about capturing all the blue dots, I think, is related to this. Because uh, the patient's story is very important. The patient lives with what's bothering with them 24-7. And um, the doctor um, only sees the patients for brief periods of time, which I'm glad to have heard uh, mentioned throughout this conference many times. Um, anyway. Um, so um, 
I guess um, this is beginning to lead to like where some of the modern technologies or some of the things that we talk about at this conference might um, try to help a little bit in um, trying to lead to earlier diagnoses. And um, one is like um, Googling for diagnosis. And um, when I originally uh, thought of this talk, I thought maybe that should be the doctor's job. After all, the doctor knows what to do with the knowledge more than the patient does. And the doctors get mad when patients sometimes bring knowledge to them. But when I think about it, I know of some patients who have actually um, sped up their diagnosis by Googling. And I think part of the reason why this kind of works sometimes is because a patient does know their symptoms much better than the doctor. And even if they've conveyed them to the doctor, sometimes the doctor isn't listening. Sometimes he gets it wrong. And he doesn't understand what the patient just told him. And when the patient sees a profile of a disease and sees that, um, I guess, that it um, matches what they have, then I think that kind of encourages them to, um, that, they ha that, they're, that they can sometimes be much better at matching what they see what they actually have. Um, and um, anyway, um, so as far as other uh, future things, I was thinking that um, quantified self and self-tracking, of course, could help a patient perhaps better communicate what's wrong with them to the doctor, especially if we're still dealing with the reality of evidence-based medicine. These guys need to be like numbers in order to um, uh, I guess uh, believe that there's something there is something wrong, um, but there are problems with that. Not everybody wants to self-track, and sometimes patients really are too sick to, I think, um, be that organized to um, do this for like long periods of time or even at all. And it doesn't even have to be digital. Could, um, we had like one patient in our support group who was a former nurse. And she kept a running journal of every medical visit, every symptom, everything that she ever did um, without interruption. She had a record of that. And she could go back to that. And if a doctor had a bad memory or, or so there was some problem, she could go back to that. And it really helped her in her medical care. Um, anyway, um, the, another um, thing is like the whole thing of like doctors keeping all this data in their head. That's like impossible for them to know all these rare diseases. But maybe it's possible to have like a database where a lot of this stuff is collected um, and where there are, uh, you know, rare diseases and, um, and, and, and their characteristics that doctors can refer to, not to like make a diagnosis, but maybe to um, come up with ideas of like what, what they could might look for li next, like a greater list of possibilities. And um, another um, thing is like, this is the last slide that I had, you know, my partial set of slides here, which is unfortunate. But um, I guess um, another problem is that I think doctors as a group probably tend to think more like each other than, um, uh, than having like a more varied set of thought processes as the general population. And um, as one of my friends who's, who's a psychologist said, um, she said that um, it's been proven that um, uh, you get better results when people try to like uh, solve a puzzle or make a decision when a bunch of people with a, different kind, a lot of different types of thought processes get together and try to solve the problem um, instead of um, people who all have just like one kind of thought process. And what seems to have like uh, sprung out of this is a uh, new startup, CrowdMed, and I had the pleasure of communicating with um, uh, Jared Heyman, the founder of this, because uh, originally I was going to put a panel together for this uh, talk. Um, anyway, he founded this company. He had a um, sister who had gone to a number of doctors over a course of three years and was very sick and didn't get a diagnosis. And what he did was he used the power of um, crowds um, basically, what he has is a bunch of people who are me MDs, not medical doctors, but medical detectives, um, try to solve diagnostic problems um, and, um, and basically come to a conclusion. Sister was the first test case, and um, apparently um, it was successful. Anyway, um, so I think that things like this are kind of like very interesting and unique approaches to the problem of diagnosis. And um, sort of finally, there is um, 
DNA. Um, I guess, you know, using things like 23andMe and uh, Nomi and, and things like this, DNA sequencing and phenotyping, um, might eventually, um, and maybe um, combining this with, um, uh, I guess, maybe forming relationships with patient community um, to sort of like um, crowdsource, um, uh, I guess, uh, data from patients and everything and help medical communities define what they need to, um, uh, need to know about diseases to identify them, not just DNA, but like even other characteristics and symptoms. Um, to help identify diseases might be kind of useful. Um, and um, this was already kind of done in, um, with blood cancers, myoproliferative disorders a few years ago. Um, the patient community got together with researchers and they divide the, um, identified the, the JAX2 gene and that helped to, um, I guess, um, develop um, not only um, help in the diagnosis of the diseases, but also in developing targeted therapies for them. And um, finally, um, I guess, um, I get, um, oh well, um, it seems to me that diagnosis is still an art and that um, a lot of the traditional things that doctors used to do, um, I think I probably, like examine patients and um, listen to their stories and stuff, um, and that those things are still important, and that um, technology isn't the answer to everything, but that maybe it